Okay, good morning. So we'll, we'll start with the second set of lectures. Um, this morning, uh, the first one is given by Charusita Chakravarti, IITD, um, on computational methods for the study of uh, nucleation. And I guess before we get going, if anybody has pressing questions about classical theory of nucleation, they to answer. <laughs> so, but anyway, if not, Charu. So, uh, is it audible? Or? Yeah. Okay. Uh, what I'm going to cover today is computational methods for the study of nucleation. And I, you would have, in the last week's lectures, you would have seen a lot of examples of these computational methods being used. And this is a very pedagogical, uh, intended to be a very simple introduction to the basic ideas behind this method. And uh, so let's just look at, uh, so it may be like all of these lectures, it may be too simple for many of the people, but anyway, I hope it will be useful to some others. So let's just see uh, what the nucleation regimes and the comput associated computational methods are, because as you would have realized from David's talk yesterday, nucleation, of course, means that in, as a function of order parameter, you can sorry, uh, you can distinguish between as a f you uh, between two phases, a stable phase and a metastable phase. This is a situation where you're very close. Coexistence would be when these two free energy minima are exactly equal. Weak, su or moder weak supercooling would be a situation in which the metastable phase is only slightly less stable than the, uh, there's only a small, a slightly higher in free energy than the stable phase. This is a situation which is very much in the rare event regime. And classical nucleation theory would be expected to work in this regime. So as we have seen, this, uh, it holds some aspects of CNT hold down to much lower temperatures. If you think in terms of a Leonard Jones liquid, which is a system that almost everybody knows, then if you are, and you think in terms of crystallization of a Leonard Jones liquid, then you can think of weak to moderate supercooling as temperatures which are less than TM, but not less than uh, 0.8 in the T to TM ratio. It, the strong, uh, the strong supercooling regime, on the other hand, is the one where the metastable phase, phase is a lot higher in stability, uh, a lot higher in free energy than the stable phase. This is a situation in which the nucleation bar barriers would be expected to be small. The size of critical nucleus would be small, and this is a regime in which you would expect that the nucleation rate would be much higher. This is a, uh, this is where you can consider doing a molecular dynamics approach, basically a brute force approach where you run a trajectory and you hope to see a nucleation event. If you look at some of the estimates that are given in uh, the standard references, typical rates for nucleation are reported to be, I mean, if somebody, if I make a mistake in the figures, just correct me, that's uh, 10 to the power 10 centimeter cube per second. And if you try to translate the probability of observing it in a uh, molecular simulation with about a million particles, turns out you would need something of the order of 10 to the power 20 time steps if you were working in this regime. But if you work in this uh, strongly supercooled regime for crystallization especially, you could expect to see it if you were in somewhere in this uh, at temperatures which are about 60% of the temperature of the melting temperature. So what I'll do is the MD part is much easier to understand and when it works it can be just a very simple way to get some insight into what's happening. So I will first do this, uh, cover this very briefly, then I'll go over to the rare event regime where really uh, the we will have to uh, use techniques that are designed for observing uh, rare events in chemical reactions or in, uh, in nucleation type situations. And within this, there are a lot of possibilities. I will actually only cover the first and the earliest uh, kind of approach that Frenkel uh, developed and uh, which is outlined in his, uh, in his annual reviews in physical chemistry. But then I'll try to give some idea of the other methods that uh, 
can be used and when they would when you would might need to use them so So as far as molecular dynamics goes, uh, you just start a trajectory at some initial conditions that are appropriate to the system at a given temperature, pressure, etc., and you run the trajectory long enough and hope to watch nucleation. Now, it, it provides some, at the very simplest level, it provides some insight into the kind of order parameters you may need and the kind of microscopic reorganizations that may go on when nucleation takes place. But you should keep in mind that the nucleation mechanisms may be different in the weak and strong supercooling regimes and you have to uh, account for that at some point. You should also keep in mind that nucleation is a stochastic process. A single trajectory is not going to be, and a single trajectory gives you information on one nucleation event. It is not, it is not a property that you can average over a single trajectory. So if you want to get information on the statistics or you want to get some quantitative information from MD, you would write, need an ensemble of trajectories rather than a single trajectory to get information, for example, on the nucleation rate. And we saw uh, some of the things that David had done yesterday, and I'll show some more, actually. If you can ident if you are um, sure of what the order parameters are, and when you run a trajectory, you can clearly identify when a nucleation event takes place. From a set of trajectories, you can calculate the mean time taken to observe a nucleation event for a simulation within a particular volume, and therefore you can work out a nucleation rate. I mean, and uh, so let's uh, let's look at a rather nice example that was published recently, and um, it's a. In, as, a, as simulation studies of nucleation go, it's a very naive one, but it's an interesting one because it's a, a simulation of methane hydrate formation. And methane hydrates are formed when a gas, which is methane, combines with a liquid, which is water, under high pressure, and it forms these solid hydrates. And uh, this is actually a problem in the oil industry. It also people estimate that a large part of uh, carbon, uh, fossil, uh, fossil, uh, carbon resources of the earth may be locked up in the form of gas hydrates. So it's also something of some uh, practical and environment, considerable practical and environmental concern. And uh, but the structure of these hydrates themselves is very interesting, because you would normally a polar non-polar solute like methane would have a very very low solubility in water. In this case, you have a methane molecule which is treated in most simulations as essentially a sphere because its tetrahedron is close to a sphere. And it's surrounded by these uh, water molecules. Only the oxygens are shown, but these pentagonal uh, rings are held together by hydrogen bonds. So these are like captured. Uh, a glathrate is a cage compound, so each methane molecule is captured within an ice, uh, within a cage formed by water molecules. And it's also interesting from the point of view of understanding hydrophobicity and so on. And uh, so there's an interesting set of, sorry, simulations published recently where did they did microsecond simulations the simulation cell sizes i think had 512 water molecules or maybe altogether about 2000 water molecules and 512 methane if i'm correct and um, they did it under um, they did it at conditions that you would expect uh, the uh, they started with this gas liquid equilibrium at 250 Kelvin. These are the hydrate formation conditions that are known experimentally. And they used fairly standard potentials. And they were able to crystallize this kind of a hydrate. It's not as ordered as the, obviously, it's not going to form a single crystal. But it's, you can see the cages, and you can see it even more clearly in the next uh, now, how do I click on the movie? Okay, so if you watch, you start with this disordered uh, mixture, and if in a little while you can see that one of the structures of the hydrate forms. Um, this is a microsecond simulation with a one femtosecond time step, so it's really uh, a billion or more. Uh, 
long trajectories and this is really a single trajectory that results in the formation of this structure which is called the S1 structure for methane. And um, so, what sort, what sort of things can you learn from just a single trajectory of that type? Because what they published was based on two trajectories, one of 5 microseconds and one of 2 microseconds. Sorry, I do not seem to be having a lot of trouble with this. Okay. So, what you can learn from this is that uh, you have, for example, if you analyze the trajectory, you can see that if you look at the potential energy, there is a little bit of a drop here, there is a very clear sharp drop over here. And if the F4 order parameter is an order, local order parameter that was designed to pick out in fact lathrate formation. And you can see that this order parameter, this drop in potential energy in fact is not correlated with any change in order parameter, but this very sharp drop in potential energy corresponds to a rise in the order parameter which is quite uh, noticeable and indicates the that there is a period during which the clathrate formation takes place and then obviously it starts to plateau out. And so, the, there is and you can also see that the, la, the time for which the system is essentially nothing very much is happening, it is just fluctuating around some kind of equilibrium is quite long and then there is a rapid uh, fairly sharp nucleation process that takes, pla takes place and the entire system crystallizes in the hydrate structure. So, even without doing too much statistics for a complex system in which you do not have too much idea of the nucleation mechanism, running a simple MD trajectory can be of help. And if you want to do better, you can, uh, you need to run ensembles of trajectories and I have taken one out of uh, Richard's uh, work where they looked at crystallization of uh, liquid silica. And uh, what, they sh what they showed is just if you, R of t is the fraction of trajectories which have not reacted by some time t. And uh, what they show is that, uh, uh, this is just simple first order kinetic tells you that the log of the fraction of unreacted trajectories should be proportional to the nucleation rate, the volume, and it should be linearly proportional to t minus t0. And if it, so, it, it, what you see over here is a log log plot of R of t versus t. And from the slope of this, you can deduce the nucleation rate. And you can see that the, I forget now how many trajectories they ran. Richard, do you remember or? Okay. Uh, a lot. So, but you can see that the statistics, statistics are pretty clean and you can get a, a pretty good nucleation rate. And also they used two or three alternative definitions of the order parameter. I think one of them was based on actually looking for a, the structural uh, signatures of the formation of a critical nucleus. The others were based on the potential energy. But you can see that the slopes are essentially the same. And so, uh, they gave a fairly well defined nucleation rate. But of course, this will not work if you are in the, if, you, if your liquid is only slightly supercooled. And then you may need to do other things. Um, let me, before I go on, any questions? For two microseconds? Sorry. Actually, I do not know uh, many things uh, about uh, simulation, so I am wondering what does okay. mean a uh, microsecond uh, or two microseconds. Okay. So, when you run a sim simulation, you are integrating Newton's equations of motion for the individual molecules, right? And to do that, you have to use a very, very small time step because, uh, to, do the, uh, to do it accurately. And the typical time step that is used when you have molecules with the kind of, uh, with the mass of water or methane, which is very similar, is about a femtosecond, okay? So if you run for a microsecond, you are running for 10 to the power uh, nine time steps, which is considered to be very long. So, you are really running a very, very long trajectory, much longer than what you would need in order to get uh, equilibrium averages for any of the standard quantities, uh, correlation functions or uh, 
equilibrium averages, right? So this is just to tell you that while MD is very, very simple, and in a sense it seems the easiest thing to do, nucleation itself is such a rare event that even in a reg regime where nucleation would be, very would be very probable, you would have to run for a long time to observe a single nucleation event. And if you wanted any quantitative information, you would have to run several of these trajectories in order to get reliable statistics, right? So, uh, ma'am? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, why was the potential energy dropping uh, at around 0.2 microseconds? Okay, the, if I remember correctly, they were doing it in NPT, and at that point, you start forming the hydrate, which is a lower energy structure, and you get a very sharp drop in potential energy. Oh, okay, but after so, that, it essentially... Plateaus off, because plat it's, you, you notice that there's a time during which, presumably, the point at which you see the drop is where you have somehow the density fluctuations in the system have managed to create a critical nucleus. And then you see, then as the system, once that's triggers, that is created, it triggers off the entire crystallization process. And by the time all the material has crystallized, and then the whole thing plateaus off again. Okay. Okay. Mm, which one? The previous one? Sorry. Oh, this earlier one? This is what you were asking about? I'm not sure. Maybe there's some local reorganization or something. I haven't looked at the trajectories myself, so I wouldn't know which, uh, which was. Uh, excuse me, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, you said uh, for these things, they have considered only two trajectories. Yeah. But uh, like earlier, you said that you need an ensemble uh, of trajectory. See, I, I mean, I picked it actually because it was an interesting paper. It also got into science, etc., etc. But it was just two trajectories. So this so is a case you where you are giving an anecdotal information almost from a trajectory, right? Because you just it tells you enough to tell you that you can do it. And the kind of if you look at the movie and you analyze it more carefully, you get some idea of the kind of fluctuations that take place before the critical nucleus forms. So it gives you a fair amount of insight. But they did not get any statistics out of it. Okay, you can get statistics out of it, but I suspect that this was demanding enough. Okay, that they didn't. Uh... And so then, if we do consider an ensemble of trajectories, then will that uh, jump in uh, at around point to actually disappear, or I mean, it, could it just be some uh, artifact of the trajectory itself? Which one? Which one? This this previous yeah, the, one. The, the point to uh, yeah. This one? The, the early jump in the potential energy. The early jump could well be an artifact. Or yeah. it could I'm well be not something that happens every time. Yeah, but so it, this, could, uh, it may, take and an it may not be But it may be correlated with some other structural arrange, rearrangement in the system. Ma'am, uh, uh, in the s silica case, let's say if the nucleation is happening in nanosecond regime and you have to do hundreds of uh, uh, simulations, but this is a microsecond regime. So, but still from, the, from this, you can get a pretty good uh, cluster distribution and two trajectories no, might not really. Be True trajectories, all you, uh, you cannot really get a very much quantitative information. You can just think about what your order parameters ought to be, the kind of things you'd expect to. For example, I mean, this one goes one step further because they did super cooling and the diff among the order parameters, oops, they looked at were the... Uh, were these two were based on the potential energy, and this one, as I said, was based on some kind of structural order parameter, um, in fact, defining the critical nucleus. So you, you won't get really any statistics or distributions reliably out of a single structure trajectory. Okay. The, this one? Uh, this is, I think, a journal that we would all like to publish in, the Clathrate one, no? This is the volume 326. No, 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 no. The other reference that you gave. Yes. Ah, yeah. Yeah, the volume is volume 124. This is Richard's paper, actually. Might be better to ask him. <laughs> JCP, sorry, I forgot the journal. Uh, yeah, I put in the, sorry. No. The previous slide. 
that jump could it be a finite size effect of the system which Because one the little one yeah why is everyone so worried about the little jump over here <laughs> Means I do I don't know if it's a finite size effect. I suspect you'd see a similar kind of jump in a lot of uh, if you ran a lot of trajectories, and it, I don't think it would necessarily be a finite size effect. I mean, there's no particular reason to expect that this is a finite size effect. Uh, I didn't know. <laughs> they started with a they started with a high temperature, and then they brought it down to these hydrate formation conditions. But even then, it may not have been fully equilibrated, or uh, that might just be settling into the metastable. Okay, uh, we'll move on. So let me just, where rare event simulations are concerned, there, uh, there are a lot of things one could cover, and I'm only going to cover a fraction. So I'll try to explain to you uh, the way I've tried to organize the material. So you can also time your questions. Um, the actually much many of the ideas in this field come from something that's quite old, which is transition state theory, which was originally formulated for gas phase reactions. And uh, as you will see, it uh, it had an important insight because it factored the reaction rate into the product of a dynamical term which was relatively easy to calculate and an equilibrium term and it required you to define a reaction coordinate and a transition state which was the high state of highest energy along this reaction state i'll explain each of these things a little more but then uh, the, the entire original formulation was actually for gas phase and there were various attempts by experimentalists to translate it to condensed phase but it couldn't really be used as a computational uh, tool in any way uh, whereas the gas phase version you could use with ab initio methods and uh, so on then uh, the bennett chandler formulation actually uh, and one of the problems with using it as a computational uh, tool for condensed phases was the difficulty in defining a well uh, uh, transition state very clearly was the bennett chandler formulation which uh, which still required you to define a reaction coordinate that would transform a system which would be a function of the positions of the particles and would transform the system from reactant to product but it removed the restriction of of identifying a single structure as a transition state and it could be used very effectively in condensed phases where entropy as well as enthalpy play an important role so uh, uh this sort of uh, allowed you to calculate reaction rates in condensed phase systems this was then this can then be coupled with classical transition uh, classical nucleation theory to study a rare event like nucleation and this is really what the original st computational studies of nucleation that frenkel and so on did in fact combined bennett chandler formulation with cnt and since we did cnt yesterday this is really what i will uh, focus on mostly over here but then this itself has certain limitations you may in, including the need to define a single reaction coordinate and getting around it has given rise to a lot of fairly sophisticated methods recently so uh, 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 which i will not go into but i i will at least discuss one of mention one or two interesting results that have come out of this so that if someone is interested they can follow up and um may i ask one question hmm why you guys want uh, require real event simulation you are thinking of i i'll just show you out of the equilibrium classes or that kind of situation no i'll uh, the rare well let me get keep the next slide and then we discuss it the rare event is really what the md trajectories tell you that if a single very long trajectory gives you a single nucleation event then it tells you that it's very very rare on the time scale of molecular uh, motions so if the molecules are vibrating or rotating at time scales of 10 to the power minus 12 to 10 to the power minus 14 seconds and you see an event like this only when in time scales of you know in a microsecond you see it once then it obviously tells you that if you use a standard simulation technique you're going to waste a lot of uh trajectory time looking at nothing that you are interested in right so rare event methods are designed to focus on rare 
I mean by definition on infrequent events that happen in your system. So you try to bias your sampling to obtain sufficient statistics about these rare events without losing the information about their probability of occurrence. Huh? But, but that probably says that you have rare events, uh, I mean, giving some physical, uh, I mean, measurable response at least to your average, which means that you probably do not have an exponential kind of tail in your density, probability density function. Maybe only power law kind of thing. Or self averaging may break. Is it the kind of situation? I mean, you are not even, on a single trajectory, you are not even able to do any averaging, right? No, that is. So, uh, uh, so, if you come to reaction rates, uh, this is uh, for those of you, I don't know how many people are chemists in this audience. Uh, I know there are two or three, but uh, people who did, uh, anyway, I hope at some point in life, since I am one, let me at least s s uh, try to remind those who might remember. All of you might have done one of these reactions, which are called SN2 reactions, where you have a uh, hydroxyl group coming in, attacking the carbon of a methyl bromide and displacing the bromide ion and it, which gets replaced by this hydroxyl ion. And uh, again, you may have seen uh, this kind of a, a pictorial representation of what goes on. This is called SN2, so nucleophilic, biomolecular nucleophilic substitution because the rate determining step actually involves the attack of one uh, entity which is the hydroxide on a second molecular entity. And so in this case, you have the, uh, you have, this is the reactant, this is the products, uh, these are the products, these are the reactants. And the reaction is believed to go through a transition state where you actually, the uh, H groups of the central carbon lie on a plane. Um, and pointing towards the corners of an equilateral triangle and you have a structure of this kind where the entering group which is hydroxide and the leaving group which are which is bromide are collinear and if you uh, you can actually calculate what might be having as a function of some coordinate that measures the course of a reaction for example you could choose to use the relative distance between the oxygen of the hydroxyl and the bromide and uh, you would find that the, both the reactant and the products are associated with minima in the energy. This is all, we assume that this is in the gas phase and there is no solvent for the time being. If you did that, you would see that the potential energy would show a, a rise at this transition state configuration. And then it would again fall towards the product. But typically, this transition state pathway would represent like a minimum energy pathway on a more complex potential energy surface. And even from just simple steric arguments, you can see that the transition state would be somewhat higher in energy than either the reactants or the products. Now, the point is that uh, if you add solvent, the picture changes a little bit because the entropic effects of having a solvent come in. But, and you're also, uh, but nonetheless, you would, for typical so, solvent phase uh, reactions like this, the rate constant is of the order of 10 to the power of 10 uh, molar inverse, second inverse. So in a liter, if you have one mole of re reactants of both types, then you, the, you would see uh, the rate constant would be, you can work out that out of 10 to the power of 23 molecules present in a liter, about 10 to the power of 10, so 1 in 10 to the power of 13 would undergo a reaction of this type in a second, which actually makes it very rare on a molecular time scale, even though in a macroscopic sense, this change of concentration is quite measurable. So chemical reactions in a sense are probably the first rare event, uh, um, uh, rare event uh, situations in chemistry for which people try to work out a quantitative way of getting the rates. And uh, transition state theory was originally formulated by Henry Eyring in 1935 and by Polanyi around the same time. And it made a very important uh, assumption actually. Um, a is the reactant and B is the product in some general sense. And what it assumed was a quasi-equilibrium situation, so a transition state A star was assumed to be in equilibrium essentially. This cannot be really true because 
A is not a, does not correspond to a minimum in the free energy surface. It corresponds to a saddle point in the free energy, saddle point of order 1 in the free energy surface. But it is characterized by an equilibrium constant K star. Then this transition state was uh, complex was assumed to break down fairly rapidly into products with a first order rate constant K star. And so if you looked at the rate of formation of products, you would expect it to be proportional to K star times the concentration of A star. But K star itself would really correspond to the frequency associated with motion. So there is a frequency associated with the curvature or a, around the transition state and this uh, the associated uh, negative frequency could be called nu and the transmission coefficient was just to correct for the fact that every time the transition state vibrated you may or may not always get the products. And the concentration of A star would be given by the equilibrium uh, constant or the quasi equilibrium constant times the co concentration of the actual reactant A. Since all equilibrium constants can be written in terms of the free energy difference between the reactants and the products, you could then write it as exponential of minus delta G by KT. And uh, so the actual first order rate constant for A going to B could be written as a kinetic prefactor which describes the very short time dynamics and an exponential uh, dependence on the free energy of the uh, uh, on the free energy change associated with the reaction uh, actually i should have put a star over here because this is the free energy change associated with the difference between the transition state and the reactant not the free energy change associated with the reactant and the product which would be a standard equilibrium constant. And so this gives you the probability for being on the barrier top. So you can do uh, use equilibrium methods to estimate this. What was done originally was to use the partition functions of the molecule that was the reactant and the molecule that was conjectured to be the transition state. Of course, transition states being essentially unstable states are very hard to observe. In fact, they are almost impossible to observe except with very specialized forms of transient spectroscopy. But nonetheless, the theory actually can give fairly good rationalizations of a lot of experimental results. And uh, the most important thing from our point of view is uh, this breakdown into a di kinetic prefactor which is short and uh, um, exponential term which gives the probability for being on the top of the barrier or being in a regime of high free energy which is intermediate between the reactants and the products. But as this theory was formulated, it could not really be used for condensed phase reactions. So, um, okay. so before I get into how the con condensed phase expression is derived, are there any questions on this? Okay, so in the so that was 1930s. In the 196, late 1960s, Bennett and Chandler came up with a reformulation of stand, transition state theory that could be used for condensed phase reactions as a computational tool. So you could actually couple it with a standard classical molecular dynamics simulation, for example, and expect to obtain an estimate of the rates. And, but the formal derivation looks very different from what I just discussed of the, uh, with the Iring picture. And that starts which I, with actually the clearest way to do it that I've found is to use classical linear response theory. So you assume that you have a classical system and which we usually for most chemical systems at normal temperatures and pressures is a reasonable approximation. And you apply a perturbation to the system that results in a small deviation from equilibrium. If there is a small deviation from equilibrium, then you expect that equilibrium will be restored. And the response of a system to such small perturbation can be analyzed using linear response theory. So in the context of chemical kinetics, what you would expect is that uh, is the analog would be a small temperature or pressure jump. So you first equilibrate your system at some temperature T and pressure P and you then give a small temperature jump for example 
and uh, uh, you've since at this new temperature, there's a temperature jump is extremely sharp. So it's essentially, I think a lot of the time they use lasers to do it, but it, you can essentially imagine a pulse at time t equals zero, which uh, pushes the system to a slightly higher temperature. Obviously, the concentrations of the reactants in the products uh, will deviate from their equi equilibrium value at the new temperature and pressure, but the pulse is removed and you allow the system to relax freely till the new equilibrium state is analyzed. So basically, you use a temperature or a pressure jump to create a non-equilibrium state, so, so th and the quantity that you observe is the concentration of either the reactant and the product, and then you wait, watch the way the system relaxes to to uh, equilibrium, and if you, uh, now what did I do, okay, I think I mixed, mixed up the order of the, yeah, I think there's a slight mix up in the order of the slides, but anyway. So this is your reaction A is to B, and regardless of whether you are at equilibrium or not, there is no change in the total number of molecules, so C A, the concentrations of A and B do not change with time. Now, uh, if, the, uh, if there is any change in the concentration of A or B, it must come from either reactions, uh, uh, the forward reaction A to B, which creates the product, or the backward reaction from B to A, which consumes the product, and similarly for the concentration of B. Now, when the system reaches equilibrium, there will be no further change in the <coughs> concentrations of either A or B, and the equilibrium ratio of the concentrations will be given by the corresponding equilibrium constant K, which will be a ratio of the rates of the forward and the backward reaction. Now, if you make a small perturbation, so you, uh, you make a small perturbation from what would be the appropriate equilibrium concentration at your new, uh, at uh, equilibrium concentration then the system will relax to equilibrium at any time t, it, it will show a deviation delta C A from the equilibrium value. So delta C A and this should be B, delta C B are the deviations from equilibrium of the, um, of the concentrations from their equilibrium value. And So if you watch the decay of the concentrations to equilibrium, then um, this is actually a standard tool in chemical kinetics. So you, if you watch the decay of the concentrations, then of course uh, they, are, they can be written as the difference of the rate of consumption of A and the rate of production of A. And uh, the overall rate constant for the, concent for the deviation from equilibrium is just characterized by this relaxation time tau which is just the uh, reciprocal of the sum of the two rate constants for the forward and the backward reaction. And this is just a simple first order exponential. So because you have a single rate constant in your system, and this tells you that uh, the time scale on which the system relaxes to its equilibrium value. Uh, sorry, this is the original deviation from equilibrium that you created. Obviously, as uh, the system relaxes, you will get to delta C A zero, uh, C delta C A equal to zero in the, when time becomes large enough. Now, if, uh, I think this is better, okay. Okay, so now we go back and look at a relationship that uh, is called the Onsegger is uh, it's sometimes called the fluctuation dissipation theorem, but that's a little more complicated than what I have over here. Uh, this is Onsegger's regression hypothesis, which basically says that for small displacements from equilibrium, the relaxation of the state of the system to equilibrium is governed by the equilibrium time correlation functions. So if you have a variable b of t, which shows some deviation, which uh, under non-equilibrium conditions, and you watch its relaxation to equilibrium, b being the uh, equilibrium value of that quantity, then obviously b of t minus b is the deviation from equilibrium. In our case, this is just the deviation of the concentrations from their equilibrium value. 
then, but it could be any dynamical variable, then what you have on the right hand side is an autocorrelation, is a, no, is a correlation function between whatever observable B that you are interested in and, and, and a quantity A which uh, is, uh, allows the perturbation to couple to the uh, Hamiltonian for the system. So, I mean B and A could actually be the same thing, but both A and B have to be dynamical variables. So, you have to define them a little bit carefully. And, but basically it tells you that the deviations from uh, or the rest, uh, the time, sorry, the time dependence on uh, which describes the return of the system to equilibrium can be described also by the equilibrium uh, time correlation function, which just the delta A is the deviation of the quantity A from its equilibrium value, delta B is the deviation of quantity B from its equilibrium value and the angular brackets obviously denote ensemble averages. And so, F is just a perturbation parameter, it measures the strength of the perturbation that you are applying on the system and uh, beta is 1 over kt. And so, it allows you to relate this time deviation to this or equilibrium autocorrelation function. Now, if you want to apply it to chemical kinetics, you have already seen that the behavior of if B is a concentration of either the reactant or the product, then delta B is going to be dis, uh, described by an exponential relaxation with the characteristic time scale tau. And uh, the, on the right hand side, you will have to define an appropriate ta, uh, autocorrelation function using some dynamical variables that depend on the position and the momenta of the particles in your system, which is what we do over here. Okay. And this is what takes you back to transition state theory, uh, because what you do, what you need to do in order to uh, define such a dynamical variable is to recognize that, again, when you are seeing a chemical reaction, your overall energy, this could be a free energy in the condensed phase, we must have two minima which correspond to the stable reactant and product state and it must go through some kind of a maxima in between. You must have a reaction coordinate which describes a smooth transformation from A to B. So, this could be some collective variable that depends on the positions of several of the particles in the system or it could be a well defined reaction, a local reaction coordinate that is easy to define and uh, you at ideally if you really wanted to reproduce transition state theory, you would have to find the exact uh, location of the maximum or the saddle point along this reaction coordinate. But if the point, the reason that Bennett Chandler theory is so uh, powerful which we will see by the time we complete the derivation is that in fact this definition of the transition state does not have to be too precise. So long as you have a reasonable reaction coordinate and you take the max, uh, take a position or a de define a dividing surface that separates the free energy wells of the reactant and the product adequately, you can basically uh, um, use it to do Bennett Chandler sampling and in this case you can if you define Q star as the location of the maximum in free energy along this reaction coordinates, you can just define the uh, a dynamical variable n as proportional to the concentration of species A by saying that this function n A of t should be a step function which is equal to 1 when z is less than q star and it is equal to 0 when z is greater than q star. So, it is just a simple step function which tells you whether you are in the reactant well or the product well. Obviously, if you want n b of t which is proportional to the, con, uh, to the uh, concentration of b, then you would have to just take 1 minus h a. So, if you do this, then the fluctuation dissipation theorem tells you that the deviation from the uh, equilibrium concentration at time t uh, divided by the deviation at time t equals 0 is of course described by this exponential over here. And on the right hand side, you see the corresponding correlation functions and the uh, fluctuation in the corresponding dynamical variable n a. So, in order to evaluate this, you need to evaluate each of these quantities or write them in terms of the step function describing 
whether you have a reactant or a product. And if you do that, you can see that the equilibrium concentration of HA square is actually equal to the equilibrium constant of HA, and that is just the mole fraction of A in your system. Yeah, I mean, this is fairly easy to show, so uh, we won't go into it. And correspondingly, the fluctuations in HA relative to uh, the equilibrium fluctuations in HA is just uh, XA times XB, the mole fractions of A and B, which add up to 1. And so you have an expression with an exponential on one side, and you have a tie autocorrelation function on the other side, which describes the probability that if you started with reactant A at time t equals to 0, what is the chance of it remaining in the reactant well at some later time t? And the rest are, of course, the mole fractions. So does anyone want to stop me or it's OK? Uh, this equation, that uh, the first equation in this slide, that delta C T by delta C A is 0, yeah, hmm. with the uh, regression hypothesis that you... It's the showed. same, actually. I will compare it, but what I've done is, sorry, I shouldn't use, try to use these things. Uh, it's this, uh, if you make this 0, then this becomes also T equal to 0, and so this becomes the equilibrium fluctua uh, the fluctuation in this quantity. Uh, I am using A equal to B, right? And what you're all, what you're doing is basically, it's convenient to divide the deviation at time t equals to zero by the deviation at time, uh, sorry, the deviation at time t by the deviation at time t equal to zero. So, it's essentially the same thing. And the factor F gets cancelled. The factor F gets cancelled if you take the ratio. And how does? I mean, you mentioned that this uh, A that will the Hamiltonian of the system? If you do proper linear th response theory, uh, uh, well, in this case, it's somewhat fictitious, right? But you need a handle on saying how you how you're going to define, uh, re equate a macroscopic concentration to a micros to, to some function of the microscopic variables, right? That's what that step function is doing, right? Um, linear response theory is sometimes easier to understand when you apply something like an electric field. Because then your perturbation f function f is the strength of the electric field, and your inter the dipole or the charge on the molecule is what couples to the electric field, and uh, then then you know you can give a clear physical meaning to each of the terms. So this is using the linear response formulation, but using the somewhat artificial way that you couldn't do in an experiment, of define of uh, relating the concentration to the probability of the species being in a certain region in configurations, please. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So this is what you have over here. Now, this uh, time correlation function is actually not very convenient to evaluate because it takes, if, because reactions are rare events, it takes a long time for anything to happen. Most of the time, if, it, if the system is in state A, it tends to stay in state A. The transitions to, the chance that you'll go to HA equal to 0 are just very small, so you may not see very much if you just use this formulation. But if you take the time derivative, again on both sides, this is what you get on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, you can show that um, you, you take the time derivative with respect to the second uh, quantity, which is a function of time, and you can use the uh, stationarity, which is, I mean, there are various properties of time correlation functions. Actually, if you look in the notes of the previous UMS, I think several of them are de derived over there. And you can show that this uh, can be rewritten as uh, you can just shift the time derivative over here, so it becomes, this is the derivative of the step function with respect to time evaluated at time t equal to 0. This is the step function at time t, describing whether the reactant, whether your system is in, uh, in the reactant or the product state. And if you take these, uh, uh, the time derivative of the step function, you can show that the, uh, you can just apply the chain rule to get this quantity. This is the reaction coordinate Q. 
this is d, dq by dt. So, it corresponds to velocity along the reaction coordinates and this is a delta function which tells you, which will uh, tell you whether the system is exactly at q star which for, uh, we will call the transition state for convenience. So, this is a function telling you whether you are at the transition state. This is telling you what the velocity was at the transition state. If you substitute this back over here, you get an overall equilibrium constant that gives you the velocity at time t equal to 0 or when the, uh, for uh, the system being at the transition state. This, this places the system on the transition state at time t equal to 0. This gives you the corresponding velocity at time t equal to 0. And this tells you whether at a later time t the system is in the reactant well or it has gone over to the product well. By just reusing the relationship between HA and HB, you can in fact just go over to the product. So, this tells you that if you start with some initial velocity of being on top of the at, at the top of the transition state at some later time t are you going to be in the reactant or the product now uh, product state and if you um, okay so i have just called the q dots as the velocities at time v equal to 0 this remains the delta function this is the uh, probability for being in the product state now, obviously, this is not, this is a simple expo macroscopic exponential with just one time tau. This cannot describe the short time dynamics of the system. But really, what, uh, what you want to look at is uh, the, is a time t, which is substantially less than the, this is where I use the board. Sorry. Which is significantly greater than the molecular time scales of a few of a femtosecond or 10 to the power minus 14 second and it is substantially less than the relaxation time that you have. If you use this approximation, then you can just simplify this, uh, exp this uh, you can just write this as 1 over tau relaxation on this side. And on the right hand side, of course, uh, everything remains essentially the same. But this is then known as a flux position uh, uh, correlation function because this corresponds to the flux crossing the dividing surface or the transition state separating reactants and products. This describes the position along the reaction coordinate. So, you can, this is often referred to as the flux position uh, formulation of the reactant rate. And um, if you just rearrange a little bit and use the appropriate uh, mole fractions, you can show that you are essentially, this should be, uh, well, this in my notation should be A to B. I was doing a little bit of cutting and pasting. So, this is the forward rate constant which will be given by uh, this flux position autocorrelation function. But the, notice the way this is written, it appears as though the rate constant is a function of time. When you look at the actual behavior, okay, let me just look at the actual behavior. Over. Uh, the exponential you chose t to be a lot less than t uh, tau relaxation, so it became 1. So, then if you uh, look at, uh, no, let me stick, okay, let me look at this diagram and then I go back. So, if you, the, what it tells you is that the rate constant apparently is a function of the, of time. But if you actually plot it, what you find is that, again, you are starting off a lot of trajectories on the transition state. Initially, some of the trajectories will go back and forth and uh, If you were truly at the transition state, then you would start trajectories with some velocity sample from a Maxwell-Boltzmann. The true transition state would be a situation when all of them, when 50% of them would go to the 
react, uh, to the reactant and 50 percent would go to the product. If you make a mistake in choosing your reactions, i.e. you don't find the exact transition state or it's too much trouble to find it, then what would happen is that there would be a little bit of recrossing. So what that recrossing means is because you're not at the true transition state or, or the behavior is a little more diffusive at the top of the barrier, you may get a few trajectories which initially go towards B, but then they turn around and go towards A. If it's diffusive, you get, may get a little more recrossing before the trajectory makes up its mind to go either towards A or B. But typically, on a time scale that is much, much less than the, uh, the tau relaxation, but which may be large compared to the molecular time scale, the system will settle down in either of either well A or well B. So effectively, you would have your autocorrelation function would stabilize at some value, and you would have a time-independent reaction rate. And that's really what uh, this shows, that you do, you initially might get a little bit of recrossing and so on, but eventually you get a well-defined time-independent rate over here. And the exact location of the dividing surface doesn't matter. Because if you make a, uh, so long as you are on, on a free energy, close to the free energy maximum, and you are dividing the reactants and the product. It may make your simulation a little less e efficient, but you can certainly correct for it naturally. Then if you take this reaction and just try to turn it into what we learned from the original transition state theory, that it should be possible to express a rate as the product of a dynamical term and an equilibrium term, then what you need to do is to divide by the equilibrium average of delta Q0 minus Q star, which just tells you the probability for being on the dividing surface. If you multiply and divide by that, you can take this ratio to be the probability of finding the particle on top of the barrier, and you can take this to be a flux position autocorrelation function. So. The probability of observing the system at the barrier top is something that you can evaluate as a relative free energy by umbrella sampling or any other free energy method, actually. But umbrella sampling is the one that seems to be most widely used. And this one over here is a conditional probability because it tells you the prob tells you the probability that if you are already at the dividing surface and you start with some velocity v0 at time t equal to 0, whether you will find, whether you will find yourself in the product well or not. So this kinetic prefactor requires relatively short MD trajectories. And this, uh, this uh, sta thermodynamic or uh, static factor is just gives you the probability of finding the system at the barrier top. So essentially, the rare event part of it is taken care of by this quantity. And it will be an exponential of a free energy, which is what we saw also in nucleation theory. And this kinetic prefactor will require fairly short time, will represent the short time dynamics of the system. And this turns out to be computationally much more efficient, because you have removed the long waiting time t that you would see in an unbiased trajectory by biasing your simulation in such a way that you're starting everything off at the barrier top instead of waiting, waiting for the system to be carried by some fluctuation or the other to a, uh, to a configuration close to the barrier top. So you need two different techniques in order to evaluate this. One is how to, uh, uh, how to get the free energy associated with being at the top of the barrier, and actually in for constructing the free energy as a function of some collective coordinate Q. And the second is how to collect, calculate the kinetic prefactor. So uh, I'll do first do the umbrella sampling, but before I go on to doing umbrella sampling, if there are any questions? No? Um, if, uh, if you look at a free energy curve as a function of an order parameter, then you are really saying that the free energy as a function of Q could be very simply related to the probability of observing that particular value of the order parameter in an equilibrium simulation, right? And if you have a bistable free energy curve, which is what you will do when you have 
either nucleation or a chemical reaction will be uh, uh, will be that if you do a simple MC or an MD simulation, you will sample either the stable or the metastable free energy well depending on your initial condition. So if you're looking for liquid to solid, if you start in the solid well, you will stay in the solid well. If you start in the liquid well, you will stay in the liquid well and you will not sample any intermediate configurations that allow you to go from the solid to the liquid. So in order to judge the relative free energies of the two phases, it's necessary to sample the intermediate configurations and transform continuously from one phase to the other. So what you do when you do umbrella sampling is to uh, bias the system in such a way that the intermediate configurations, the one which are not sampled in an equilibrium simulation starting from either the solid or the liquid, become relatively more favorable and you're able to get the uh, get some reasonable statistics and it's done in a way that you use a biasing uh, potential that will allow you to that will favor the intermediate configurations which would otherwise have a low boltzmann weight but then you remove or correct for the bias so that you can get the exact free energy so let's just look a little bit at the at how this would be done and the example to keep in mind is uh, solid liquid in this case because that's what I will also use later. But in principle, it could be used uh, for any other situation in which you have two free energy well. So let's consider the NPT ensemble because under NPT conditions, either, uh, either the liquid or the solid phase will be stable. And so the, if we define the partition function in the NPT ensemble, um, just removing the uh, kinetic uh, or the ideal part of it. It's the configurational integral. It will just be the exponential of minus beta. U of x is your potential, which depends on the coordinates of all the particles. PV is just the term you need to be maintain the constant pressure condition. And dx and dv, dx, I haven't used vectors, but dx represents uh, the differentials in all, x represents the positions of all the particles in your system, v represents the range of volumes that your system, because in a constant pressure ensemble, your volume can fluctuate. Now, if I want to define the probability of observing an order care parameter q, what I need to know is the equilibrium of average associated with this delta function, which picks out the configurations x for which the order parameter has the exact value of q. And now if I add a biasing potential, the biasing potential is designed to favor configurations or with a Q, with Q values that have a high free energy at equilibrium. So the easiest thing to do is to make the biasing potential a function of Q itself and tune it in such a way that it um, favors reg regions of high Q. So what you, in the presence of this biasing potential W of Q, which we have not yet defined and we will soon, but in the presence of this biasing potential W of Q, you will get a new set of probability distributions and the fact that they are coming from a biased or a non-Boltzmann simulation is indicated by the, the subscript W. And uh, if you rearrange this a little bit, you will realize that this delta function again, the presence of this delta function and W of Q means you can take out this exponential e to the power of minus beta W of Q outside the integral. And if you multiply and divide by the unbiased, the, by the partition function of the unbiased system, what you're left with over here, this integral is actually your original P of Q. So in principle, if you have a biased histogram of order parameter, or giving you order parameter distribution, you can relate it to the unbiased P of Q distribution by just using this relationship, F of Q is minus KT log Q, uh, P, w, P Q, unbiased Q. It's related to this biased histogram or probabilities P of Q, P W of Q. You correct for it by subtracting minus W of Q, so the biasing potential at that value of Q, and this is just a constant term. And, uh, you can recover it, as we shall see, by imposing a continuity conditions on your system, on the overall free energy curve. So, 
So this is the expression you need. So in principle, it is possible to introduce a systematic bias which favors configurations with, uh, 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 which can favor any particular value of Q, but you can choose it to favor un, un, uh, intermediate configurations and correct for that bias and recover the true free energy as a function of F of Q. So what could be, ideally of course, suppose you were to do this, instead of a sharply peaked probability distribution with two uh, peaks, one for the solid and one for the liquid, supposing you wanted a completely flat distribution. So you wanted PW of Q to be completely flat and independent of Q. That would be a situation where WQ would be, have to be equal to minus F of Q. This is of course not possible because you wouldn't be doing a simulation if you already knew F of Q. But what you do is to choose a fairly simple functional form. That is, uh, uh, one way is to use a set of windows in the order parameter. So, set of windows in the, so you start with, you can divide up this configuration space. Very rarely are you able to do it in just one single bias simulation. And in each of these, you put in these kinds of harmonic potentials, which essentially will tend to make the uh, system stay in this particular order parameter window. And uh, harmonic potential is very easy to create. The bias is very easy to remove. So the other way is to use a sequential uh, approach. So you start with, for example, a simulation in the solid well or the liquid well, whichever is more convenient. It's usually easier to go from an ordered to a disordered state, so you start with the solid. You obtain some uh, free energy curve, and you fit it to a polynomial and extrapolate it to a neighboring window. Then in the neighboring uh, overlapping window, use this extrapolated potential as your biasing potential, perform the simulation again, and uh, that would lead to a sequential... Uh, change. So these are the commonly used choices of either using harmonic window potentials or doing a sequential construction. If you want to do, this has certain advantages because the simulation in each window is independent of what happened in any of the adjacent windows. So if you wanted a parallel algorithm that would work in each window, this would be a better choice. This is sometimes an easier choice for creating a smooth transition from the solid to the liquid, but in practice, both of them are about the same level of effort because you have to uh, uh, put in a certain amount of trial and error into figuring out what this f effective force constant should be so that you get a reasonable sampling in each order parameter window. So I'll first do a simple one which just looks at the solid to liquid transformation. This is not just, uh, but it gives you a chance to also think about appropriate coordinates to choose for various uh, situations and using umbrella sampling. So you want to go from just construct a free energy pathway as a function of some order parameter that measures how crystalline your system is and transform it from the solid to the liquid. And you expect it's a first order transition, so you expect to see a maximum. And uh, so what would you uh, choose as an order parameter? Again, a lot of you would have seen this many times over in the first, uh, uh, in the last week, but uh, let me just define this. Turns out, because we are eventually going to use it, we could use a translational order parameter for the solid, but it turns out that before, because we are eventually going to use it for nucleation, we don't really want, uh, uh, want something that imposes uh, Translational order can be a little tricky because we want it to be applicable to a very small crystallite and therefore it's better to look at something which can be defined, uh, which can be later turned into a local order parameter that would also apply to a small uh, embryo of the crystalline phase. And the bond orientational order par parameters are more convenient from that point of view. And it's uh, just to look at it in 2D. This is the triangular lattice in 2D. We define a bond as not a chemical bond, but just as a vector connecting two nearest neighbor particles. 
and these vectors will obviously if uh, have a certain relative orientation so these need not just be between any two pair of nearest neighbors you can define a vector of this type if you have an ordered arrangement you can see that regardless of where the vectors are there is global order in the system and therefore all these bond vectors have a certain correlation in their orientations which is what the bond orientational order parameter will pick up and in this case you would expect the vectors to have uh, some relative angles regardless of where they're located which are some multiple of 60 degrees or whereas if you look at a square lattice on the other hand you would get a very different bond orientational order so in principle it can be used to distinguish between lattices of different types if you look in a liquid on the other hand if you look at just the local order in a liquid, there will be some local order because effectively in 2D you will tend to have six nearest neighbors and there will be small distortions from uh, this kind of a triangular lattice. But of course all the long range correlations will die out. So if you use these bond orientational order parameters, you can uh, distinguish definitely between the bulk liquid and the bulk solid. And so these are good ones to start with and the way they are defined is that the orientation of any bond vector is given by uh, so if this is your bond vector r then its orientation with respect to any space fixed axis is, is given by theta and phi and you can define a corresponding spherical harmonic characterized by the, the integers l and m so um, now when you have symmetries of certain kinds in your solid lattice only certain values of L or M will give you non-zero order parameters in the solid and uh, so L, the choice of L equals 4 or 6 is usually conventionally one that will be good for FCC, HCP, BCC etc. Um, the, e, the odd order ones disappear in most in uh, most of these lattices. I think it's only in tetrahedral that you get a Q3. And if you average these uh, bo bo this quantity, which is essentially a spherical harmonic depending on theta and phi, over all bonds in your sample. So if you're looking at a global bond order, since you're looking at a global bond order parameter, you average over all the bonds in your sample you get this uh, QLM bar which indicates an average. Then in order to make the uh, or orientational order parameters rotationally invariant, you sum over all possible values of M from minus L to plus L. This is the way the summation is constructed. I forgot to put the reference. It's uh, Steinhardt, and Steinhardt and Nelson 1983, I think, physical review B. And uh, if you put these in, you can create, construct, for example, these Q4, Q6. You can also construct higher order uh, bond orientational order parameters. You get very distinctive values depending on whether you have an FCC, HCP, BCC, or simple cubic lattice. Typically, just the Q6 is sufficient, actually, for you to go from the solid to the liquid. Going from the liquid to the solid is not easy using these techniques, but... Uh, uh, in certain cases, we have also used just the volume as an order parameter under NPT conditions, and that also works. <coughs> so, assuming Q6 to be your order parameter, these are some results for a Leonard Jones with a slightly modified Leonard Jones potential near coexistence. And if you just, this is for example, what you get for a hot FCC solid. If you had a completely ordered uh, FCC solid at 0k, you would expect the Q6 order parameter to have a value of 0.575. But because your solid is close to melting and it's a relatively high temperature, so therefore you get a single uh, well and it corresponds to essentially a Gaussian distribution of the order parameter. And uh, this is the solid well. You can see that the ifs, the liquid on the other hand, if this, these are completely unbiased simulations. So if I do an unbiased simulation, I stay entirely within this well or within the liquid well. This is the error in the wings of the distribution, which makes this a little cluttered. But you can throw away the points where you have too little statistics in the wings of the distribution. 
And obviously, the entire reason why you're doing umbrella sampling is otherwise you, there is no way to close this gap in order parameter between the two solid and liquid wells. So you can see that we did a large number of simulations in a lot of uh, adjacent wells, and uh, which are shown in different colors. And this is the point at which uh, you have a change. You can see that there's a change in curvature coming in. And then each of these, so in within each well, you have, dis, uh, you have derived the true f of q. That's what each of this. So this should be really the f of q. This is q. But these f of q's are not aligned. They don't form a smooth curve because each of them, there is an additional additive constant that you need in order to get the exact f of q. So to get, recover that, essentially what you do is to just shift each of them up you can do it more mathematically and uh, accurately. But you can essentially think of shifting each of these pieces of the puzzle up. And if there is, in fact, a smooth transformation, you find that continuity is obeyed. And you can construct a curve that uh, I put all the, uh, you can play around small tricks, but you can essentially construct a smooth curve. If for some reason you haven't chosen the right order parameter, one of the things that's going to happen is that you will may happen is that you see a very sharp discontinuity or something clearly goes wrong. You're just not able to make a smooth transformation from one phase to the other. And you've either hit a phase transition or defined a poor order parameter. The x-axis is the q6 values, right? Yeah. q6 is equal to 0 implies what? q6 equal to 0 inf uh, implies a liquid. Actually, I should have brought this up. But you look at the way it's defined, it's basically always a positive quantity. So it goes really to 0 only when you have an infinite lattice. Okay. In a finite, q6 equal to 0 implies that there's no crystalline order at all. Right? So uh, q, in this case, you get a small value because you're using a finite system. This was, I forget how many particles this was, something around 200 or 300 maybe uh, particles. So. Um, this is the global Q6. Yeah? So the global Q6 doesn't really go to zero only because you're using a finite system. It goes to something small. Anything else? No. OK. Now, the point is that, uh, well, I mean, I made this mistake, so I'm telling you that you can make it. Uh, you can go from the solid to the liquid very smoothly. The question is, does that mean it's a good reaction coordinate to look at solid to liquid transformation, and how would you judge it? Because you may frequently uh, ha be in a, or if you're looking at an unusual system and you may be having to look at it more, then you may make a poor choice. And in that case, how do you know whether you've made a good choice or not? And the answer is from Maxwell Boltzmann, but would every configuration should give rise to a set of trajectories with the same initial position, but different choices of momenta. 50% of them should go to the liquid, 50% should go to the solid. If this is not the case, and this is not a good order parameter, you'll find that while all these configurations lie at the barrier top, not all of them have a 50% probability of giving rise to a reactive trajectory, or one that state you're interested in. Therefore, you, this is a test that if you are not sure whether your order parameter is correct or not, you can try it. Or in this case, you can just show that, in fact, you can do this test and show that the barriers, while this kind of approach is very good or reasonably good for giving the relative, thermodi uh, relative thermodynamics of the solid and the liquid, it gives you coexistence, it gives you metastability limits, and so on. It does not, in fact, correspond to a situation where every configuration on the barrier uh, top 
has a 50 percent possibility of going one way or the other. And so, and in general, in fact, global order parameters are not good for studying nucleation. You should be, nucleation starts with a fairly local event of forming the critical nucleus. So you shouldn't, in fact, expect that the global par parameters will be good. On the other hand, you are looking for a nucleus of a crystal. So you need to define some criteria for identifying a crystalline nucleus. And therefore, you, what is done, this is essentially what Frenkel did in his initial studies, and most people seem to have continued with it, is to, can I continue? Uh, is to look at the corresponding local order parameter. So you no longer average over all the bonds in your system, but for every atom I, you look at all its neighbors NBI and sum over only the spherical harmonics associated with those nearest neighbor bonds. This gives you a quantity Q6MI, which is associated with a given particle I. If you are interested just in, in, term, just in the local order around particle I, you would just construct this just the way you do the global averages, taking the modulus squared of this, summing over M and taking the under root. But since you are interested in uh, the degree of correlation between local order in local order between particles I and J, because that is what will tell you whether you are starting to form a crystallite. Therefore, I mean this is, I think they didn't ever really bothered with the normalization factor. But what you look over here is a kind of a dot product. So you sum over all M values, but you look at this Q6 M quantity coming from particles I and J, which are neighbors. So if this dot product exceeds a certain threshold, the particles are said to be connected. Once you have decided which are the connected particles, you can use a cluster identification algorithm to just find out a set of connected uh, uh, solid-like particles. And this is, uh, you can get these cluster identification algorithms from the, uh, Alan until this needs one place. Distance would be the simplest, but it won't tell you whether they're both ordered. So it won't tell you whether you have a solid light cluster or not. For liquid vapor, that may be okay. You know, they're close enough, but not for solid inside. which lies at the top of this barrier goes down. And so what we are left with is finding the kinetic prefactor for the, how much time can I take? Okay, so the kinetic prefactor for nucleation, as we learned yesterday, this is just the density of the liquid in the case of solid liquid crystallization, uh, in the case of crystallization. This is the Zeldovich factor and this is the attachment rate, the rate at which a sing, uh, the cluster grows by size one. 
So, plus indicates that it is growing and minus which I will indicate later is that it loses 1. So, I think these are the quantities that David was calling alpha and beta. So, what you do is this is the point at which you have completed the umbrella sampling. You have found the you have used your cluster size as your nucleation coordinate. You found the free energy for forming the critical cluster. Now, you run a large number of dynamical trajectories starting with configurations at the barrier top which <coughs> presumably all call, contain a critical cluster of one type or the other. <coughs> when you run these trajectories, because the dynamics in these cases is fairly diffusive and you are not interested in the short time dynamics, you could, in, you could use molecular dynamics, but you could also use uh, some more, more stochastic dynamic schemes like kinetic Monte Carlo. And uh, you run these trajectories in order to estimate this dynamical prefactor. The z factor is known from the curvature at the top of the barrier. Uh, yesterday we had this estimate of the attachment rate, but obviously you want to do a little better than an estimate. The estimate was uh, diffuse, is just the diffusivity, uh, self diffusivity of the liquid. N c to the power of 2 by 3 is the surface area of the cluster and lambda is the, is the characteristic length associated with diffusion. And, but if you want to do a little bit, I mean obviously you are doing a simulation in order to make that more precise. So, what uh, Frankel and our showed is that you could write this attachment rate in a, in a form that was very convenient for evaluating in a simulation. So, you look at the mean square change in the number of particles in the critical cluster and this is of course just the difference between the size of the critical cluster at time t and its size at time t equal to 0 and you square it. So, the effective diffusion constant for change in cluster size is would just be like one dimensional diffusion. So, half delta n c squared by t and if you express this change in cluster size at time t as a function of t, you can, uh, no, this should be for a single time, you can do it in terms of the attachment rates and the detachment rates and you can show that effectively this attachment rate is given by, will be given by delta n c square t by, so you are basically measuring uh, this quantity by monitoring the mean square displacement of the uh, mean square change in the size of the cluster as a function of time. So, you are observing out of your transition state ensemble which are the clusters that grow and shrink and what is the time scale on which they do it. And okay. So, if you monitor this, this is the cluster size n as a time t, this is taken from the reference is given at the end, but it is uh, from a recent paper and archive. And you can see that there is a fair amount of fluctuation in the cluster size as a function of time, but if you actually calculate the mean square change in the cluster size, MSD in the cluster size, you get fairly smooth curves as a function of time and you can extract uh, effective diffusion constant from this. The green line if you can see it is the fit and the red line is the actual data. And so, you can actually evaluate the nucleation rates and I will show a comparison at the end. Let me just uh, do a couple of things. So, we moved from transition state theory which could not be used for, con for uh, condensed phases which required a precise uh, understanding of what the structure of this transition state would be in order to do any calculations. Then we went to Bennett Chandler, Chandler sampling which required a reaction coordinate that was reasonable, but did not require an exact specification of the transition state configuration and could be used uh, in uh, simulations for condensed phases. And then uh, see, uh, the story may not be that CNT and the size of the cluster may not be sufficient and therefore you would also like to sample possibilities of other reaction coordinates or other order parameters which may control this change from one phase A to another phase B and that is where techniques like path sampling become very useful 
And these actually sample, try to construct, instead of doing a bias sampling in configuration space, you try to do a bias sampling in path space and pick out the reactive paths that connect configurations A and B. And in that case, you can obtain multiple order parameters by an, analyzing the paths. And for example, for a Leonard Jones system, this is a by spelling mistake here, by Peter Bollhurst, uh, which looks at uh, Leonard Jones crystal and on the, it maps out the free energy as a function of two order parameters. One is the size of the critical nucleus as identified by the techniques we indicated, we just looked at. And on the y-axis, it plots the cluster Q6 parameter. So it is, sorry, it is not truly global and it's not truly local. It's an order parameter that looks at all the bonds within this connected cluster and defines Q6Cl that way. And uh, if you look at this, you find that while most of the time N does seem to be a good reaction coordinate, uh, in the sense that your free energy path runs parallel to it, you can see that the Q6 CL parameter does tell you that there is some change in the size and shape of clusters as you move along this uh, for different values of N and therefore allows you to analyze a little more of the structure and size interplay in these systems. But uh, an assumption which still remains in transition path sampling is some kind of equilibrium, existence of some kind of equi equilibrium distribution of paths, uh, for example, if not critical nuclei. And therefore, and one of, uh, kind of approach that tries to get around this equilibrium ap approximation is the so-called forward flux method, which I won't try to explain over here. But that basically requires you to define a collective coordinate going from A to B, define a series of consecutive interfaces, and just look at the trajectories going from one interface to the next. Essentially, it is more efficient because it collects all the configurations at intermediate inf interfaces and runs relatively short MD trajectories to see which one of these will travel to the next intermediate, next interface. Eventually, you can con con obtain the connecting paths th that go as far as the uh, product state, but it allows for a lot of recrossing, a lot of paths which do not finish, et cetera, et cetera. So it's probably hard, the most demanding computationally, but also the uh, least biased in terms of the initial assumptions that you make on the mechanism. And finally, I'll, uh, this is a very useful preprint uh, that Harry told me about, which looks at the hard sphere system and co compares three different ways of computing the nucleation rate. Uh, one is the molecular dynamics, the other is forward flux sampling and umbrella sampling. And it shows you that more or less if you make the same kind of definitions on the order of identifying the critical nucleus and so on, you get essentially consistent results with all three com computational approaches. But of course, uh, the, I mean, the regimes of validity of MD and the other two are very different, and forward flux can probably give you a little bit more than the others. And finally, let me, much of what I have said actually comes from these three sources. One is David Chandler's book on statistical mechanics, and much of the description of nucleation is from this review by uh, Orr and Frankel, and this uh, last one is from the book by Frankel and Smith. So let me stop over here. Uh, there's a question about your, um, this global Q6 order parameter. So uh, you have used only the nearest neighbors. Yes. Uh, I mean, that one could standard. define a series of these things by looking at uh, nearest neighbors and then larger than nearest neighbor and, and second nearest neighbor yeah. and so on. Um, I guess, uh, I mean, the near, I'm not sure what you would get out of the second nearest neighbors. In uh, some cases, you, it's worth going to it when you expect that there'll be some, some distortion from the local. Uh, 12 coordinate kind of structure for some reason. But uh, I'm not sure, I mean, once you go global, you are in any case accounting for a lot of spatial correlations that way. So I'm not sure that. Uh, yeah, it's just that uh, uh, 
in two dimensions, for example, the immediate neighborhood of a solid and a liquid might be very similar. But if you go a little bit further on... You would have to go a lot further on, no? Okay. <laughs> in, the, in the 2D. But yeah. uh, because I, I haven't really... I mean, I, I haven't thought too much about it, but I'm not sure that in the just between the solid and the liquid, going to the second neighbor makes a lot of difference, unless, except in certain special situations. Well, uh, the second neighbor distribution is 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 rather different between the solid and the and the liquid. It, it might be worth looking at be. because I I know it is in a lot of these anomalous fluids, but I'm not sure. But, uh... Okay, if there are no more questions.